Good morning to everyone, now formally. Good morning and welcome everyone to this um, special panel this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. My name is Soldanela Rivera Lopez. I am one part of the 50th anniversary committee and also out of the president's office, I work in strategic initiatives. And I guess this is a combination of all of that. Today's panel, Puerto Rican migrations from colonial times to the present pre and post uh, Hurricane Maria um, is a really special uh, conversation. I hope everybody enjoys it. That's why I want to make sure that if you don't understand Spanish, that you raise your hand so we can get you a translation device. Um, because since we are Puerto Rican, some people, you know, we speak Spanglish. We don't do it on purpose. We don't do it to be mean or spiteful. It just comes out, especially if you're talking in, you know, impassioned. Um, it just happens like that. I want to make a general announcement as well before I begin to introduce uh, the program. The Office of Communications in the Division of Institutional Advancement just put out this amazing, beautiful magazine, Kaiman Chronicle. There are copies outside. Make sure when you, when you leave, you, you take one. Um, amazing stories, beautiful writing, great people, like all of us here. So, um, and thank you for, you know, the team, because it really, it's, it's a beautiful magazine. So as we carry on, this part is in English, so I'll just carry on while Rafael distributes. We are on schedule, amazingly. Um, I said, I, I thought we were going to begin about 11-11, so here we are. So uh, thank you all for coming once again. I'm really glad you're here. I hope that this discussion um, strengthens you, inspires you, helps you help us help uh, our beautiful island of Puerto Rico and our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean. The panelists are amazing. I'm, it's not my job to present them. Javier Gomez, the wonderful and the one and only Javier Gomez, will present them a little bit. My task right now is to give you our awesome president, David Gomez, who wants to greet you, and I welcome you to the podium. Thank you, Sodanela, and welcome everyone. Um, since the reason you are here is to listen to our wonderful panelists and not to me, I just want to thank you for taking the time to be here, and I want to ask you to please think very deeply about what you are about to hear. The history of Puerto Rico is very dense and very complex, and it speaks to what is happening on the island today, what can happen in the future. My own personal history, my grandfather was the last generation who was born a Spaniard and died an American citizen. And interestingly enough, just in time to be drafted for World War I, I'm sure that was coincidental. Our ability to act intelligently in the coming weeks, months, and years is going to depend on how well we understand the incredibly complex phenomenon of the history of Puerto Rico from colonial times to the present. So with that, I will turn it back over to Soldanela once again. Thank you so much for being here, and I plan to listen very closely as well. And next up, as is customary here at Ostos Community College, Professor Thelma Itier Sterling will sing, play homage to the island of Puerto Rico with her beautiful voice. You can sing from wherever you want, Thelma. You can come here, I can pass you a microphone. This song it talks about the depression and the uh, results or effects of the depression of those years in Puerto Rico where the, uh, actually it was like the beginning of changing the economy from a agricultural uh, economy to a uh, industrial. Sale el loco de contento con su cargamento para la 
ciudad soy, para la ciudad llevo en su pensamiento todo un mundo lleno de felicidad, sí, de felicidad. Pienso remediar la situación del hogar que es toda su ilusión, sí, y alegre el jibarito va cantando así, diciendo así, cantando así por el camino. Si yo vendo la carga, mi Dios querido, un traje a mi viejita voy a comprar. Y alegre, también su llegaba al presentir que su cantar es todo un himno de alegría. En eso le sorprende la luz del día. Y llegan al mercado de la ciudad. Pasa la mañana entera sin que nadie pueda su carga comprar, ay, su carga comprar. Todo, todo está desierto, el pueblo está muerto de necesidad, sí, de necesidad. Se oye este lamento por doquier en mi desdichada borinquen, sí, y triste el jibarito va cantando así, diciendo así, llorando así por el camino. ¿Qué será de Borinquen, mi Dios querido? ¿Qué será de mis hijos y de mi hogar? Borinquen, la tierra de Edén, la que al cantar el gran Gautier llamó la perla de los mares. Ahora que tú te mueres con tus pesares, déjame que te cante yo también. Yo Thank you, Thelma. So now to carry on with the program, I am delighted to introduce, actually this is the first time, a, a friend, a colleague, a veteran, a publicist, a radio, a, a, a show host. Um, he's, he's a real professional and, and a great man and we're happy to have him. I'm so happy that you're here and thank you so much. Javier Gomez. Uh, good morning everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to what will be a crash course in Puerto Rican migration. This is a very complicated subject and also very broad, but we felt an obligation to at least start, uh, touch the tip of the iceberg so we can go home with some questions of our own. And also we can go home thinking, what is my role, my individual role in this situation? So very briefly about the panelists, we have with us Professor Ana Lopez from the Ostos faculty. She will tell us. 
she will tell us about the historical aspects of migration before and after Hurricane Maria. We also have with us Sonia Valentin from WAPA America and WAPA TV, noted journalist. Uh, Sonia is visiting us from San Juan. She will be telling us about what is happening in Puerto Rico as she has perceived it on the street, reaching communities via helicopter, going to the most remote places. So she's like our eyewitness here. Thank you, Sonia, for making it. And also with us, we have Mirna Rivera from Consultiva. And Mirna <laughs> is also visiting us from Puerto Rico. And she will tell us about the economic component of migration and how does the e economy has contributed to this situation and what has to happen in the future and what is likely to happen in the future. And next, we have with us also uh, Professor Soto, Hector, Hector Soto, also from CUNY Hostos. And Professor Soto is here in um, his capacity as a lawyer, lawyer and a sociologist. So he will be telling us what, right, 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 right. He is an expert in many things. And uh, he will be telling us a little bit about the constitutional law and how it applies to Puerto Rico. One thing of the equation, one aspect, is the sentimentality uh, that some of us feel about this topic. But there's another whole issue, which is what the law actually says. So the professor is here to clear our minds and set us straight on that. I think one way to begin the panel is to have each panelist. They all come from very specific areas. They are all eminences within their area of study and work. One good way to begin would be to ask them the same question each so they can answer it from their microscope, from their telescope, and then we'll take it in terms of individualized, and then we'll open it to questions and answers. If you have a question, feel free to write it down, and then someone is gonna collect those at the end so we can, um, so we can uh, answer those. So the, the first question, let's start with you, Anna, because you're closest to me. Everyone will get the same question. The idea is to hear the same answer, I advise you, is going to be the same answer from a different point of view. And that's very important. So the question is, it's right here on my phone because I want to be exact. Um, professor, from your expertise area, what is your take on Puerto Rican migration? How, what, how does it impact your work? What is your point of view on it? Um, I think that um, as the Puerto Rican diaspora, uh, this hurricane, is increasing the number of Puerto Ricans that are going to live in the diaspora. Now, right now, more Puerto Ricans live outside of Puerto Rico than in Puerto Rico. And um, according to my presentation, which I'm going to show you some statistical analysis, um, it appears that almost a million Puerto Ricans will be moving to the United States, and that's going to create a great impact for them. Uh, in terms of cultural adjust adjustments, but also how are the different cities and areas where Puerto Ricans are going to go to, how are they going to be received? So our responsibility as the diaspora is to welcome them, help them, but also help them go back to their homeland, which is very, very important. Thank you, Professor. Now, Sonia, same question, la misma pregunta. Desde tu área de trabajo, eh, ¿Cuál es tu perspectiva en cuanto al asunto de la migración puertorriqueña? Bueno, realmente, hola, ¿cómo están? I'm going to be talking in Spanish because it's easier for me. <laughs> y es un tema complicado, así que prefiero manejarlo en español. Eh, la realidad es que eh, desde la perspectiva de las comunicaciones, si me preguntas, eh, la migración en este momento pues, no es, es caótica. Realmente la gente está saliendo de la isla pues, por manadas. Eso ha afectado de todas formas la, el área de las comunicaciones específicamente y, y la realidad es que eso trae muchas otras complicaciones eh, no sé realmente tu pregunta es cómo ha afectado el área de las comunicaciones específicamente o cómo tú lo percibes en este momento bueno lo percibo eh, la palabra real es fatal o sea la, la situación en, en, en puerto rico eh, es crítica y la salida de tanta gente va a traer otras consecuencias y otros problemas mayores. 
¿bien? Y, y está saliendo mucha gente, no hay gente entrando, lo cual sería también positivo, pero no está ocurriendo en este momento. Y eso trae muchas otras complicaciones eh, en el lenguaje de las comunicaciones, pues, bueno, pues eh, eh, en algo muy real y simple, eh, han cerrado muchísimos shows de televisión, los periódicos no están eh, necesariamente trabajando y haciendo el trabajo que tendrían que hacer y la gente más valiosa desde la perspectiva eh, profesional está saliendo de la isla y eso va a traer muchas consecuencias, que ya tendremos tiempo de hablar. Eh, Mirna, lo mismo para usted, same for you, uh, from your microscope, from your filter, your take on Puerto Rican migration in general terms. Then we'll go into specifics. Good morning, everybody, and uh, greetings from Caimito, San Juan, Puerto Rico. Donde la cosa está bien dura. Okay, so let me give you some historical perspective. Uh, this is all about, from where we sit, it's about the jobs. Um, how many of you are from Puerto Rican parents who were raised in New York? Uh, it, well, I mean, you were raised in New York, right? So you come from Puerto Rican descent. Okay, so how many of you, and I would suggest, ask your parents why they're here. Why you weren't born in Maricao, or in Loiza, or in Luquillo, or in San Juan. And that's going to add some dimension, a very important dimension as a community, to why we're here. It's about the jobs. It was about the jobs during Lamento Borincano, it was about the jobs during the Depression, and it's about the jobs now. So what's happening now is that we've seen an acceleration in migration because the jobs are not there. Our, our, we're an investment advisor. Uh, we are co-fiduciary for foundations in Puerto Rico, the endowments of our universities, the endowments of our churches, some of the public funds, the credit unions. We get, and, and also individuals and families and professionals. So we get the optic of the entire island just by going from one meeting to the next to the next. And I can tell you that the last three weeks has been quite, um, quite critical because to the question, if you are a university in Puerto Rico, and your students' parents are leaving because there's no water and electricity. Now imagine 149th and 3rd without water or electricity for two months. Think of all the things you cannot do because you have no water or electricity. So if, you are, if you're a professional, a CPA, or an attorney, or you own the bodega, or you own the community pharmacy, you can't work. And not only can you not work, your 20 or 30 employees cannot work, okay? This is very simple. It's about the money, it's about the jobs. And so as Consultiva has 25 employees, were it not because we're living in a building where electricity came on two weeks later and we have internet, I would have had to file for bankruptcy three weeks ago. And so it's me, it's the business, and it's all of the people who work for me, and the businesses that they do business with, and their communities, and their children, and so on, and so on, and so forth. So what's happened after Maria is an acceleration of what happened back in the 90s. Puerto Rico went through a military industrial 936 um, transition, economic transition. We had a massification of the middle class in Puerto Rico, and upper middle class. A lot of us were left behind, which is why a lot of us are here. But there was a massification of the middle class and upper middle class in Puerto Rico. In 1990s, the Congress of the United States issued two acts of Congress, NAFTA and the termination of Section 936. And that created the downside of what my generation had seen as the quote unquote evolution, economic evolution in Puerto Rico. So we've been seeing migration out of Puerto Rico since the late 1990s the 2000s, because the jobs went away. The termination of 936 cost us 130,000 middle class high income jobs. So you can't pay the house, you can't pay the car, et cetera. Maria puts an incredible twist on this. By the way, there were tornado winds in Puerto Rico. This was not just a, 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 you know, a category five. So it destroys the entire infrastructure. So we woke up and we went to bed in 2017 and we woke up in 1940. Okay? That's, that's the image. What happens? JetBlue puts you in Orlando for 300 bucks. Uh, no, do you want to finish that? Yeah, finish well, the, you know, the thought, claro. So if you are a doctor, a CPA, you have two children, you don't want them to lose school, and you have a friend, okay? Te fuiste. Te fuiste. Because JetBlue puts you on the other side for 300 bucks. 
Es así de sencillo. Entonces, we are, we are paying $1,500 in round trip tickets. I almost didn't get here because the planes are leaving full and they're coming back empty. There's no tourism. To this day, two months and one week. There's no electricity in Old San Juan. There's no reliable electricity in the condado. The entire tourist area is closed, shut down. There are over 10,000 jobs at risk in Old San Juan by virtue simply that the businesses cannot open. The backbone of any economy is their small to middle-sized businesses, the ones who hire 20 to 30 people. Okay, so that's the laundry, the bodega, the, the club, the cafes, the bookstores. Um, those are the companies that are shutting down. Your attorney, your CPA cannot work if they don't have electricity and telecommunications. It's very simple. So if they can get on a plane and rent someplace, oh, and by the way, if you can stay and you buy a generator, or tu familia manda un generator, right? As many of us have done. Okay, so here's the math. It costs us four times the monthly expense of electricity to keep the generator going, okay? I said that you as a business person can be, how long can you run it to the other side of the blackout? If the blackout is more, we're going on two months and two weeks. Caimito, we haven't had water or electricity since Inma. So, so how long can you last as a business person before you have to face the fact that you're going to have to shut down. And you start by letting go two people, and then you let go another three, and then you let go another two. It's all about the money. It's all about the job. Thank you, Mirna. That's very thought-provoking. And uh, I'm going to change, after the professor speaks, I'm going to change a little bit the format, because I like what's happening here. And rather than asking you questions individually after the professor speaks, I'm, we're just going to have a conversation. <laughs> because uh, Irma has opened the Pandora box ahead of time, and we love it. So, Professor Soto, uh, if you can explain to us, before we go into the in-depth discussion, uh, from your telescope, constitutional law, civil rights, how, how does this migration issue relate or is, is connected to your area of work? I think for me, if you're gonna talk about the migration, the question is why are Puerto Ricans, why have Puerto Ricans left Puerto Rico in the past? What facilitated that passage from Puerto Rico to here? What created the situation in Puerto Rico that prompted people? And I think two things. One, what is the relationship of Puerto, what has been and is the relationship of Puerto Rico to the United States? Right? I think in, as, as President Gomez indicated, it's a very complicated history, even more complicated and more um, intertwined if you start looking at the legal, at the law, and the history of the relationship to Puerto Rico. The other is this issue of citizenship that flows from the status and the relationship of Puerto Rico to the United States. And let, let me, I will expound on this a little bit more later, but the issue of citizenship actually gets a lot of play, but it's the, it's the one that I think is the least important in terms of the entire, uh, the entire scenario. It has facilitated for the same reasons uh, that were already brought up. I mean, once plane fares became relatively cheap in the 1950s and you had this access, people started voting with their feet about the economic situation in Puerto Rico that was maybe improving, right? But improving as compared to who? And let me just say that at the end of this relationship where we are now with the United States, after a hundred and something odd years of involvement of the United States with Puerto Rico, we still have a nation in Puerto Rico that is poorer than the poorest state of the union by a significant amount, right? So we have poverty rates in Puerto Rico that double the poverty rates of Mississippi, the poorest state in the union and the state that has the lowest income levels in the United States. And so the conditions, although maybe if you want to, if you'd like to compare it, say, well, let's compare it to some small, let's compare it to Uruguay. And I, I don't know, but I think by now Uruguay is probably comparable. But the comparison because of the relationship has to be with the United States. And I think in terms of the aid that's being given or the response of the United States to the hurricane damage and the situation of the people in Puerto Rico, I think it reflects this, 
this lack of relationship or equal relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States, and at the core of the, of the issues, when we get back and put everything aside, that relationship is what determines why people leave, how many people are leaving, who's going to go back, and what is going to be the ultimate outcome, uh, the ultimate status of Puerto Rico in the future. Thank you, Professor. Now, uh, let's start at the beginning, but not go that far back, but get the historical context. Um, Professor Lopez has a presentation about the numbers, so we can understand a little bit how has Puerto Rican migration uh, changed post and after Hurricane Maria, and then we'll open up even the Pandora box even further. Okay, so what I did was a brief study of the migration patterns of the Puerto Rican people and focused on um, implications of the mass exodus after Hurricane Maria and the humanitarian crises. So, but my opening statements, we really have to look at the migration patterns of Puerto Rico within the colonial framework. That Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States and that each change in the economy has produced mass exodus of the Puerto Rican people. And that Congress still makes all the decisions pertinent to Puerto Rico. And that the U.S. imposition of citizenship, which Hector Soto is going to look into it a little bit more, um, did not grant the same privileges and immunities of the U.S. Constitution. That Puerto Rico has become the fifth largest consumer of U.S. goods, um, and Puerto Rico pays 20% more in fees and taxes for those goods to come into Puerto Rico. That in itself creates a huge economic burden for Puerto Rico. And now it's a hurricane, so it's not consuming at the same rate. The colonial conditions imposed in Puerto Rico continue to exist even when Puerto Ricans migrate to the United States. A lot of people say, well, if I move to the United States, my conditions are going to improve. No, the same colonial conditions exist here, making Puerto Rican community an internal colony of the United States. There is a purposeful U.S. governmental plan and intent to depopulate de Puerto Rico and reduce Puerto Rico's population, which in, under international law is considered ethnic cleansing. We, we call it here in New York, um, um, when, when they go into your communities and change the demographics of your community, we call it uh, what is it called? That we gentrification, but under international law, that's called ethnic cleansing. So that we need to look at look at it from that perspective. So, m with this um, remark, I want to say that as a diaspora, we have to fight to repeal the Jones Act, to end Promesa Law, and to get rid of the Fiscal Control Board because those are the problems in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico may not have an economic problem; it has a governance problem that once it's in the hands of the Puerto Rican people, we can really make decisions to change our livelihood. So I want to compare two hurricanes that happened before and compare it to the Hurricane Maria. In 1828, we had a hurricane, San Felipe Segundo. It was a five category. And it, it all happened in September. September is the month where these deadly hurricanes pass by. And there was an estimation of 33,000 dead and it devastated a coffee, sugar, and tobacco and created huge unemployment. This has happened before the Great Depression. After the Great Depression was San Ciprián. Everybody knows about San Ciprián because the Pleneros wrote songs about it, Bomba en Plenas, and that was a category four, but it devastated Puerto Rico because it entered through the eastern part of the island and exited through the western part. And economic conditions worsened to the point that the poverty level in Puerto Rico the problem that the workers were having, especially the sugar, sugar workers, it's really prompted, created conditions for a real strong nationalistic movement to raise, to develop in Puerto Rico under the leadership of Don Pedro Aviso Campo. So the Great Migration. This is the 1950 migration where two-thirds of the Puerto Rican people uh, left Puerto Rico. And I don't say left left Puerto Rico. It's really they were pushed out, out of Puerto Rico. When you look at migration, there's always a pull and push factor. So what was pulling the, the cheap labor source into the United States was in the, in the cities, the garment industry, the piecemeal work, the uh, textiles, the farming. 
these are the kind of workers the United States needed. So the governor of Puerto Rico, Luis Munoz Marin, in cahoots with the U.S. government, made an agreement that they were going to push out two-thirds of the Puerto Rican population, and then the pulling factor were the businesses here, the, co the factory, the sweatshops that needed cheap labor. So it's not coincidental. So under this Great Depression, Puerto Rico was very dependent on the United States. Um, the banks of America and industries felt they failed the, the failure of those banks and was even greater in Puerto Rico because that's where it comes from. Wall Street has played a very, really big role in Puerto Rico from the very beginning, especially the creation of the, uh, uh, the monetary system in Puerto Rico comes from Wall Street. So what I want to say is that the, what happens now in terms of after Maria, it, two weeks ago, developers from the United States were already um, speculating in Puerto Rico after Maria. So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. Um, so I, I just have some information here that uh, this prompted some, the migration to the United States, the types of jobs that were uh, available, um, and the, the fact that air travel uh, was formed was a way for Puerto Ricans to travel. Someone mentioned that already. Uh, sort of facilitated that push factor into uh, inner cities in, in the United States. And in 19, from 1946 to 1950, 31,000 Puerto Ricans migrated per year to New York. So I focused a little bit about New York because this is a huge of where a lot of the Puerto Rican migration came to. And it's not the same with um, Hurricane, post Hurricane Maria. Puerto Ricans are not coming to New York. They're going to other areas. And I wonder why, right? <laughs> the rents are too expensive in New York to come to New York. But also, is there a, a, a job market for Puerto Ricans to come here is the other. So in 1948, the Migration Division Department of Labor in Puerto Rico opened its offices in New York City. And its mission was to mediate between the island and New York Puerto Rican community to, to support their adjustment into the community. And there's a great author, uh, professor who works in Brooklyn. She wrote the book, From Colonia to Community. And that's when you saw in the 60s and 70s and 80s, Puerto Ricans developing communities in the area of Williamsburg, Bushwick, South Bronx, Spanish Harlem, um, Manhattan, Lower East Side. And they all resemble the little Puerto Ricos uh, with, the, with the bodegas and the piraguas and, and the festivals and the Puerto Rican parade and, and so forth. So this is a, a census that was done um, of Puerto Ricans in the 1980s. And this is just to give an image of where Puerto Ricans were living in large numbers. If you could see the East Coast, we call it the Eastern Corridor, where Puerto Ricans settled all along the eastern part of the United States, from Boston all the way to Philadelphia, and some in Florida. So you're going to see the difference between this map and the map that I'm going to show you after Hurricane Maria. Um, some in California. And, and, and then you have in the middle, Midwest with the area of Chicago. Um, so this is just a graphic of, to show the indication of the increase of migration of Puerto Ricans from 1910 to 2012. And you can see a progression. After 9-11, 2000, um, New York City lost a lot of um, Puerto Ricans. They left New York because they lost their jobs. And they went into the area of Connecticut, um, Pennsylvania, and enclaves to uh, Florida, Tampa, and Kissimmee, and Orlando. So the Puerto Rican um, study, uh, Puerto Rican Center for Puerto, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies in Hunter is doing some projections of the rate of migration, and it has found that in two years there is going to be half a million Puerto Ricans living in the United States from after uh, Hurricane Maria. And it estimates that, that Florida will get the maximum amount from 40 to 82. And this projection was done in October. Um, last week it came out in the news that already Florida has 129,000 newcomers of, um, from Puerto Rico. So this is a breakdown of migration pattern um, 
into the United States post Maria Exodus to 10, 10 states. And they do a lower bound and upper bound, meaning it's sort of like a projection of what might be the max maximum amount and the lower amount. And again, as you can see, Florida, Pennsylvania, Texas, New York is in fourth place of these places. Um, I'll put this up and give it to, to the uh, celebration for, for um, to Saladena, right? so that she can put it up and you guys can have this information. Um, so this is a graphic of, of this information. Um, so you could see it in, in a bar graph to indicate that Florida is going to have the largest amount of Puerto Ricans living there. And, so, and this is a graph that shows comparison of post-economic crises because Puerto Rico was already in an economic crisis before the migration. And, and um, so the dotted black lines, that's the increase of migration from Puerto Rico to the United States, um, shown in the peak. And then the yellow, the red um, dashed lines in the bottom, that's the before you had Puerto Ricans going to Puerto Rico a lot, right? People were migrating to Puerto Rico. They were retiring in Puerto Rico. And what you see there is the dip of Puerto Ricans not going to Puerto Rico. And Puerto Ricans who go to Puerto Rico, are retiring there, really are a source of income for Puerto Rico. And this map is, it shows the population size of Puerto Ricans post Maria. Um, the red is Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico, and you can see a dip of a reduction in population going down uh, to 3,000, 3, 3 million. And then you see, in terms of Puerto Ricans and the diaspora, with the migration of Puerto Ricans from Puerto Rico, going almost to reaching us, 6 million um, in the diaspora. And this is a graph of the map. Remember I showed you the 1980? that the concentration of, of Puerto Rican was more of the eastern quarter of the eastern part of the United States. Texas and Florida. Puerto Ricans are going to the southern part of the United States because these are their states, especially Texas, that is providing a job. They are the pulling factor. So jobs are being uh, provided for them there. And you can see in New York is a lot lesser number than we saw in the 1950s of that great migration. Uh, to New York is 26,000, Pennsylvania is uh, 59,000, Ohio 28, and Florida 182,000, and Texas 60. This is per year, the increase of migration. Um, I thought this one was really interesting because it breaks it down by age, and one can analyze that the migration patterns of Puerto Ricans, the bulk of them, it's really the working age from 18 to 50. That's the age of workers. So that means that Puerto Rico, there's a brain drain because professionals have left, and the workforce of the Puerto Rican people is going to be gone. So who is going to produce for Puerto Rico? Humans are a human resource for, for a country. And if you don't have your workforce, that really uh, spells out uh, an atrocity of coming to Puerto Rico. And this is more of a breakdown per state, and again, the biggest number of people uh, migrating are the workforce. So we do something about it. We are, the diaspora is very upset. So we have a march this Sunday to Washington, D.C. to protest the unfair treatment of Puerto Ricans during the hurricane. So we ask you guys if you want to come with us, you, you can talk to me about that. And 60 Minutes just did something 46 days after the hurricane. It was a very good report. Okay, so I'm going to close here because other people got to talk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. That was really, really a fantastic overview, a real crash course in history. So that answered a lot of questions up front, and that helps us actually move the conversation forward. Giving the context that uh, Professor Lopez just provided and the numbers that are staggering and shocking and also the facts behind those numbers are shocking and sad and outrageous depending on how you choose to look at them. Sonia, you've been on the ground since this happened. 
with the TV crews at WAPA. Considering all this historic context, all these numbers, and what's happening, ¿qué perdemos y qué ganamos? ¿Qué pierde y qué gana Puerto Rico? What does Puerto Rico lose? What does Puerto Rico win with migration, if anything? Bueno, yo, yo quiero comenzar retomando un poco lo que ellas han expuesto, tanto doña Mirna como la profesora Ana López. Eh, en el aspecto económico, ciertamente la parte económica termina siendo el factor más importante en este momento en la isla porque... Lo puedo decir de primera mano, no me lo contaron. Mi familia tiene una, una pequeña, pequeños laboratorios clínicos, toda la gente está desempleada. ¿Por qué? Hay una razón. Todos ellos tuvimos que mandarlo con mucho dolor en el corazón a sus casas porque en el caso de la medicina, que trataba de un poco conversar con ella sobre, es que está regulada federalmente. Por lo tanto, no hay forma, si ella le pone mil dólares o mil dólares por encima del costo de que tenemos una planta, ¿cómo puedes manejar, es recuperar ese dinero. No hay forma de recuperarlo. So, la única opción en el área de la medicina, que es un problema muy crítico en Puerto Rico en este momento, porque nos espera una crisis profunda en la salud, es que no hay manera de sobrellevarlo por la situación de las regulaciones federales que le tocan a ese tipo de, de, de trabajo que es la salud en Puerto Rico. Por lo tanto, esa empresa, literalmente, ¿quién se está yendo? Pues ella lo dijo. Médicos tecnólogos, médicos rayos X, enfermeras, profesionales, gente que eran microempresarios o pequeños empresarios, como ella explicaba, y lo vivo de primera mano, soy productora de televisión. Tenía 13 productores, están todos en su casa. Entonces, lamentablemente, todas esas pequeñas empresas, pero ¿por qué no puedo producir? Pues no puedo producir porque en el caso particular no, no había presupuesto para tener una planta en nuestra oficina. Pues nos, movamos, nos mudamos a la estación. Sí, pero la estación no tiene aire porque no hay luz. Y estamos transmitiendo para ustedes, no para Puerto Rico. Nos ven aquí, allá no. Entonces, ¿cómo paga la estación mi operación si no puede pautar un anuncio? Eso es lo que ya estaba explicando, ¿verdad? En términos económicos, yo se lo estoy explicando en términos arrobichuela de por lo menos mi industria. Por lo menos mi industria. Entonces, todo termina siendo una cadena que en final lo que ocurre es que la gente se tiene que ir, obviamente, se, forzadamente. Pero entonces cuando miramos el tema, hice algunas notas porque ya no me vuelven a coger, ya no me vuelven a coger. <risa> eh, eh, la realidad es que la migración, y me corrige usted, ha existido en todos los países latinoamericanos y ha existido en el mundo. La migración no es un problema, la migración es una razón eh, fundamental y una respuesta de ciudades, países, conglomerados, gente, a unas situaciones particulares. Unos han emigrado por razones económicas. Cuando miramos el 30, había una migración económica. Y cuando miramos el 2017, hay una razón económica. O sea, el lamento borincano sigue siendo el mismo, cambia su protagonista. En aquel momento eran jíbaros, gente de la, de, trabajadores de las fábricas, trabajadores de las ventas de las viandas, Hoy día se nos van los profesionales, se nos van los preparados, se nos van los que pueden sostener el país de alguna manera. Esa clase media educada que en un momento llegó a ser la clase profesional en Puerto Rico eran los que eran básicamente la clase media, porque ¿verdad? mi mamá venía de pobre, estudió y ese estudio la sacó hacia adelante y terminó siendo una clase media. Si no se hubiera quedado en el barrio. Hoy día estudiar realmente no le produce eso a un puertorriqueño no hace cambio en su economía en muchas ocasiones y tiene que emigrar y tiene que irse para poder generar un cambio económico. La realidad es que hay razones políticas de migración. O sea, si bien la migración no es un problema y no lo, debe, no lo veo yo como un problema, sí es una situación particular en este momento y fue en el 30 también. En este momento porque se nos vacía el país de la gente que puede sostenerlo. Y se nos quedan a los que hay que sostener. Entonces, la crisis económica se va a ir agravando, porque si yo la gente que trabaja, como muy bien usted señalaba, que son los que estamos capacitados para pagar contribuciones, para seguir moviendo el motor del país, nos tenemos que ir y se queda mi mamá de 83 años, que lamentablemente lo único que hace en ese momento es literalmente recibir servicio. 
porque necesita la salud, necesita la transportación, necesita que le coordinen cita. O sea, ya es un momento de la vida que ya has trabajado y lo que tiene, y vas a recibir servicios porque no puedes realmente ejecutar. El, no el caso de mi mamá, ¿verdad? Porque sigue trabajando como, como el primer día. Pero, pero la mayoría de la gente no. Entonces, miremos que la realidad es que crea un problema de desfase esa migración de hoy en comparación con la anterior. Si se nos va toda la gente joven, ¿quién produce en el país? Ese era el planteamiento. Eso lo vivimos de María para acá en toneladas. Entonces, lo que no, esta es la migración que no puede ocurrir. Esta de ahora, la que nos deja allí solo las personas más dependientes, ¿verdad? las personas que necesitan toda asistencia gubernamental y las personas que necesitan cuidados médicos con un sistema médico que no los puede sostener, que está en crisis y está en quiebra. Entonces, ¿cómo vamos a mantener a esta población? Pues realmente eh, eh, esa es la preocupación más allá. ¿Qué ganamos de la migración? Bueno, pues todos los que se han venido para acá y se han ido para cualquier parte del mundo, en algún momento han servido de voces. En Puerto Rico la situación política... ¡Ay, Dios! <risa> es de nunca acabar. Entonces, eh, la realidad es que tenemos... Bueno, lamentablemente a mi generación le ha tocado sobrevivirla. Buscar la manera de cómo la sobrevivimos. Pues la realidad es que la situación política, mucha, nos, los, que, los que han nacido ahí con ese mar tan grande que se convierte en una barrera incluso a veces para el conocimiento, que no, ten, que no sale a ninguna parte, un señor o una señora que vive en el centro de la isla, que no tiene internet porque Puerto Rico es uno de los lugares con menor acceso al internet, que no tiene esa ventana al mundo, piensa que lo que vive es lo correcto, que está bien que no hay ningún problema, ni en ser pobre, ni en ser colonia, para los que piensan que son colonia, ni ser Estado para los que quieren ser Estado, no es problema. Ahora, sí representa un problema. El problema es que no entendemos nuestra situación política, por lo tanto, toda la migración se convierte en nuestra única voz. Esos son los que entienden dónde se resuelven los problemas de Puerto Rico. En Puerto Rico, la gente piensa que va a su alcalde, y de su alcalde va al Capitolio, y del Capitolio resolvió algo. Pero la realidad que conocemos detrás de la estructura política es que se resuelve en el Congreso. Entonces, como se resuelve en el Congreso, y la señora Naranjito pensó que porque fue allí donde Yello Rodríguez, que es el alcalde, no, no es, no es Yello Rodríguez. Hipotérico. <risa> Exacto. Eh, pues piensa que resolvió el problema pero ese no es el problema. Entonces, la migración es importante, yo la veo a veces como positiva, esta en esta ocasión es muy complicada porque nos deja en no. La realidad es que nos permite crear esa conciencia que hay acá de que el problema se resuelve aquí, las voces que caminan. Me dice que no, no se resuelve aquí. Ok, okay. y la, literalmente, hay, hay, eh, por eso estas marchas para mí son importantes, porque si no, la voz no va a llegar nunca. Realmente, ¿cuánta gente viene eh, literalmente de Puerto Rico a marchar? Pocos, me imagino. ¿Y cuántos pueden? Oh, no, no, de acuerdo, de acuerdo. Estamos completamente claros. No no, 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 no. Lo que pasa es que nosotros no tenemos voz aquí. O sea, los que estamos en la isla no tenemos voz aquí que no sea la, la, la migración. A eso es a lo que me refiero. O sea, me refiero a que si precisamente si no puede viajar a una marcha, ¿quién me representa en la marcha? Los que van a marchar este día. Los que están aquí, que van, que se van a montar en una buceta. Bueno, es, no, no, es un, es, no, es, es un problema en este momento caótico. Y bueno... Chicos, something that we should, we, that we want to get from this panel is immigration regardless of a problem or not, is a fact. Eso, And we have to deal eso. with it. So o sea, y, y, we have y, to y la realidad, no, que la realidad es que la gente ha migrado siempre. O sea, y, y bueno, pues, eh, no, no, lo tengo claro. Eh, nadie quiere migrar. Lo que pasa es que la, es una realidad que ha sido circunstancial en distintos momentos en todos los países del mundo. O sea, eso es a lo que me refiero. Yo no digo que ustedes vinieron aquí porque quisieron. 
Ese no es el, eso no es lo que estoy diciendo. Right. Lo que estoy diciendo es que la migración es un problema real que ha ocurrido en todos los países de Latinoamérica por distintas razones, fueran políticas o económicas. Y es una dinámica. Uno, y como todo en la vida, yo no lo veo como problema, solamente por una cosa. ¿Sabes por qué? Porque todo tiene algo positivo. Y para mí lo positivo son ustedes. Los que están aquí que de alguna manera, de alguna manera pueden servirnos de voz. Yo, no, yo no, no pienso que es un, una tragedia china, literal, que hayan venido. Para algunos lo será, para otros ha sido oportunidad, para otros ha sido mejor futuro, para otros ha sido una desgracia, pero así es la vida. La vida no es unilateral, la vida no tiene un solo camino. Hay gente que, mi tía vino aquí, cumplió 103 años aquí, migró cuando el, 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 20, el 30, el 40, en el 40. Y la realidad es que su vida... Para ella fue bien. A lo mejor para mí pasar este frío, esta angustia, vivir fuera de la tierra, a lo mejor para mí hubiera sido una tragedia. Pero lo tengo que mirar de los dos lados. Algo se gana y algo se pierde de la migración. For, es mi opinión. For those of you who don't have headsets, in a quick uh, nutshell, Sonia was basically talking about, I asked her, what does Puerto Rico lose, what does Puerto Rico win in this? She spoke about the loss of, of the young people, the entrepreneurs, the innovators, the, the, the middle class that moves the economy professionals. And she explained a little bit about her own experience as an entrepreneur in the film business and also in the medical field, because she also runs a business in the medical field as well. And then we discussed a little bit, is migration a problem or not? Well, it is a problem, and at the same time, since it is a fact, you have to figure out what to do with it, how to, how to empower it, and, and how to make it something positive, because it's not going to go away. We have to be honest about that. So at this moment, it's very good to bring Myrna back, who opened the Pandora box today. And uh, we have to bring her back, considering that this is not going away, uh, Myrna. We've already established the impact. What do we do? Or what needs to happen? <laughs> Sorry. All right. Okay, so 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 let's go back to the you know military, industrial, and 936 economies in Puerto Rico. The massification of the middle class, which provoked migration because it didn't capture everybody, right? By the way. I was, I'm a child of the Puerto Rican diaspora of the 1950s. I was brought to Eagle Avenue. So I was raised here. Yeah, para que lo sepan. Sí, sí. My parents were in their early 20s, and I've always said that my parents were far more courageous than I could ever be, because you come to a country that doesn't want you, what, you don't understand the language, where people live on top of each other, and they speak, you know, and it's very cold. I don't know that we would have the courage to do something like that, but that's what they did. It, uh, and, and so that's the story of migration. So I'm very attached to the whole story of migration. The, the, the development, the quote unquote economic development in Puerto Rico between the 1940s and the end of the 90s was based on fundamentally foreign capital. It was somebody else's money coming in, right? It was US companies that were being were given tax um, opportunities and so on and so forth. And, and they took it. And guess what? It massified the middle class in Puerto Rico. Que se llevaron más de lo que dejaron, that's a different story. Pero there's a massification of a middle class, right? And so there's capital that's moving around. Um, the two acts of Congress that I told you about um, led to many of those companies going someplace else. They went to Ireland, they went to Switzerland and they left these holes in our communities. Um, these were industrial plants, so if you had a plant in Juncos, you had 1,200 employees. If that shop shut down, Juncos died. And that happened in Juncos in 2001. So we can go on and on now. The whole East Coast, where it was like a chain of pharmaceutical plants, right? So you leave this incredible goal. So there's a lesson, the takeaway to that is, if it's capital that comes from the outside, it's eventually going to go away. So in order, in order for us to not do that, you need local capital investing in local companies and each other's ideas, and that's called um, entrepreneurial ecosystem. Puerto Rico did not, my generation, 
did not develop an entrepreneurial mentality because we were getting wonderful middle class jobs in the pharmaceuticals and the industrials. And with an overlay of political prosecution, okay, persecution, which is another topic. So we were raised, no te meta. You have an opportunity, ¿verdad? We have an opportunity to go to school. I got a degree in mathematics. I was a mathematics professor leaving college for a while. That never could have happened if my parents had not left. And so the opportunity, the, the, the qualitative leap in the, in the quality of life of my parents' generation versus my generation, I could never replicate it for the generation that's following me. In, it, qualitatively, it's, impossi it's financially impossible for me to replicate the degree of the el salto, the degree of the leap between their quality of life and what they allowed for my quality of life. So, so how does, what does this have to do with, with what we're talking about? I was not motivated, my generation was not motivated to go out and take risk and invest capital and do crazy things like start businesses. Why did you have, why would you want to do that if you had a government that was employing in massive amounts in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and you had these other companies that were coming in, and you could become a CPA. University of Puerto Rico plays a historical, fundamental role. I hope somebody, one of these days, writes the book on the role of the University of Puerto Rico in economic development in Puerto Rico. They, we produce the, pharmacist, the pharmacists, the doctors, the CPAs, the attorneys. They were all produced largely at the University of Puerto Rico. And so the university became the factoria you know, the, 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 the producer of the intellectual capital that went into these companies. So these companies died and went to heaven until the tax exemptions went away. So we had a generation that that was the choo-choo thing. We didn't have to step out of that and get a loan and start a business. I could be a CPA or an attorney or a pharmacist or a, or a sales assistant or an administrative assistant at Johnson & Johnson, and that was the end game for my generation. To be a teacher, to be an engineer in Autoridad Energía Eléctrica, that was the dream. That was the dream. That was the dream. I said, Ingeniero en Autoridad Energía Eléctrica, are you kidding me? That was the dream. So my generation went for that dream. My, the, the generation that follows us are the children of the crisis. They were born in the 90s, and all they have heard is the crisis. Cuando era bueno, when it used to be lo que fue, lo que fue. And so, you know, our, my generation saw that, that rise and it saw the collapse. By the way, the private sector in Puerto Rico, individuals, and I've written about this, between 2004 and 2014, the private individual capital of that middle class lost $50 billion. 50, so everything that two generations accumulated, we lost. And we lost in the shares of Banco Popular and the other banks in Puerto Rico. And then it was the real estate crash. And then it was something else. And now it's the bonds. Bonds is chapter four, by the way. It's not the first chapter of the, cri of the economic crisis. So, you know, so the children of these people got to go to great schools, got to go to private schools. And, and by the way, the Puerto Ricans are the Latinos without the visa problem. So what's going on with Connecticut and New York and Florida? And, and Texas, they are going to Puerto Rico, they're going to the University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez, and they're plucking our best engineers, they're plucking our best medical students at Crescinto de Ciencias Médica, they're hiring our cops, our nurses, our janitors, right? Why not? Because the Hispanic community in the United States has been growing massively since 2000, and you need bilingual professionals, and where do you go get them? Puerto Rico. Uh, Myrna, in a, in a quick conversation before we go to Professor Soto, in a quick conversation yesterday you mentioned about the need to reverse the migration. Uh, can you explain a little bit about that? Well, okay, so in Puerto Rico, a little known secret is that, you know, the, the, that, middle, that same middle class over the last 40 years in our uh, endowments and foundations and insurance companies and banks and other massive in institutional portfolios, there's over $30 billion in investment portfolios in Puerto Rico. And I've been ranting for the last 10 years about if we take 5% of that for local impact investing, we can have our cake and eat it too because it's all about creating jobs. If you have a good job, why, why does migration happen? If you have a good job 
and you can provide for your children, and you eat arroz de habichuela, you're a happy camper. You don't have to leave. It's when somebody does something to that picture <laughs> that you need to, to go out. So how do we reverse it? We need to create local companies. We need to invest our local capital in, in growing and developing our local companies so that those jobs don't go away because the capital is not going to go away. And that is beginning to happen. The upside of this story, ladies and gentlemen, because there is an upside, is that there is a generation between right now, between 40 and 50 years old, okay, are sick and tired of the crisis story and saying, we got to put our money where our mouth is. Uh, yo no me voy, yo no me quito. I'm going to do whatever I can do. Hurricane Maria obviously is an awful, you know, atraso, right? It just pulls everything back. But I'm telling you because I see it in my industry. So how do you reverse migration? You begin to create an ecosystem of local companies, small to medium-sized enterprises, funded by local capital, and maybe outside capital, because outside capital is smart too. They see the opportunity and they see it. But not the massification of the pharmaceuticals. We don't need the 1,200 job companies. We need the companies that create 20 to 40 jobs. Thank you, Marina. That was very enlightening. Now. Uh, Professor uh, Soto, uh, before we go to the Q&A, we definitely want to get your take on something very special. And uh, we all have ideas, we all have solutions, everyone. But what does the law say that we can do and we can't do? And what's your take on the overall situation? Well, I, don't know. I think there's so many thoughts running through my head right now, but... And I, I need to push back a little bit against Midna's presentation, not in the sense that it's incorrect, but I think that it misses the point to the extent that the issue is who creates the framework or who, just makes, who has the power to make the decisions, to do all of these things, mm -hmm. to allow all of these things. And if you are in a, a relationship where there is not parity between the two parties and where you're in a relationship that has existed since 1898, where Puerto Rico is subordinate to, by various degrees, or in the various titles, to the United States. And it's the United States that decides, uh, unilaterally most of the time, what is the framework, and what is allowed and what is not allowed. And it does that either directly through the control that Congress has over Puerto Rico, or the, the matters in Puerto Rico, even internal matters that they said were going to be the province of the Commonwealth in 1952, even those matters are, are on the table. If the United States can dictate to Puerto Rico and can decide that this is what we're going to do or have its allies in Puerto Rico, those who, who are more interested, you know, and sometimes, not, sometimes with the best of intentions, well, the thing is we have to be practical and get the jobs. But if, and so they're the allies. They become the, the complicit in the, in the overall scheme. As long as the United, the United States does, has this relationship, Puerto Rico is always going to be reacting to. The storm, Maria did a couple of things. One, it ripped the cover off the state-like veneer that existed in Puerto Rico. And two, it ripped, it ripped the cover off the relationship by the response of the United States. The United States has made it clear as compared to the response to Texas and, and Florida that Puerto Rico is not only second class citizenship for the population, but you are in a subordinate position to every state in the union and, and we don't have to respond to you. Now that was the decision of the cases, the so-called insular cases that date back to the early, in the early 1900s. It was somewhat uh, reconfigured at least, or at least I don't want to say fake news, but there was a veneer, a different take put on it when the La Ley Constitucional came into being in the so-called Commonwealth. Commonwealth is a title. They, they borrowed that from the Commonwealth of the Philippines who gave it up in 1946. They said, well, let's use it over here now for Puerto Rico. But it has no legal standing. There is no such thing in the law uh, as a commonwealth. What we have in Puerto Rico is a possession and territory of the United States that is subject to congressional oversight and control. That is not a new definition. That was a definition from the 1900s, and it was recently that same 
the Supreme Court reached the same conclusion in two cases that they heard in 2016, uh, Puerto Rico versus Villa Sanchez and Puerto Rico versus a bank in California with a very long name <laughs> that I don't remember. <laughs> but the upshot of those two Supreme Court decisions is nothing has changed since 1898. Nothing has changed since the Foraker Act in 1902. The imposition, and it was an imposition of citizenship. Puerto Rico, was, the people of Puerto Rico were not consulted about citizenship. In fact, there was a delegate assembly that had been a, an administrative body, a delegate assembly of 35 that had been created by the Foraker Act in 1902 to act as some sort of a legislative body. They said, no, we don't want Puerto Rican citizens. It was done anyway. Now, now it's a coincidence that two months later, we, the United States enters World War I, and 20,000 Puerto Ricanos, mostly conscripts, end up fighting in mm. World War I. Uh, by the way, in terms of migration, that was the start of travel privileges, courtesy of the United States. Those same privileges were granted in, during World War II and during the Korean War and during the Vietnam War. So we have, you know, again, I think that reflects the power relationship that the, the relationship that exists in Puerto Rico with or without citizenship is one that is for the benefit of, based on the needs, priorities, and expectations of the greater economy, the greater political power, the United States. And to the extent that they can do that by benign neglect, if not outright exploitation, that's what is continuing. So Puerto Rico will continue to be reacting to uh, this, the, whatever crisis it is, an economic crisis, a, a climate refugee crisis, whatever crisis hits, you know, that saying that when the United States has a cold, Puerto Rico has pneumonia, I mean, that pretty much sums it up, what's, what's going on, right? We have this exploitation, exploitative relationship with the United States, and until that is addressed, and I'm not, this is not to say that Puerto Rico as an independent nation will be able to solve anything, but at least it will be able to make its own decisions without having to take into consideration, what is Congress going to say? What is the United States? What is the, what is the, peop the, uh, the uh, representative from Montana think about what we're doing here in Puerto Rico? So I mean, the, the issue has an economic, it, it, the uh, situation shows itself in the symptom that is the economy. It shows itself in the symptom of the, of the attitude of the people. It shows itself in a number of different ways. But underlying everything is the, the nature of the relationship between Puerto Rico and the United States and as long as there is not parity in that relationship, the si we will be sitting here 10 years from now dealing with the same issue under a different context. Thank you, Professor. That was really, really powerful. Thanks so much. Now, we are about to enter the Q&A uh, portion of the day. Uh, I, I wanted to mention something that we have to understand. Because of the direction that our panel took, we're only discussing migration to the USA, but just so you know, migration is going everywhere. We have a huge Puerto Rican community in the Dominican Republic. Some people here are products of that, and we're actually gonna show you something at the end of the event today. We're gonna show you a video, a testimonial video of a, of, a, of a family, someone who's very close to home that has roots in Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic. Also, Costa Rica has a humongous Puerto Rican population, Colombia and also Spain. So they face their own different realities and their own different issues as well. Some are similar, some are not. Um, so let's, let's do questions. Um, if you have questions, make sure to send them around. Uh, this one is a follow-up to Professor Soto. And this is a, a little bit of a comment. The student says, uh, the more I hear about Puerto Rico, the more I turn to think or realize that Puerto Rico must decolonize and achieve liberation and justice. Question for the panelists, whomever want to answer. Uh, what is your belief on the statehood of Puerto Rico? Is that a solution? Or the solution? Or how can we get that parity that you mentioned, Professor? So, Let, my, Professor my short answer is we're never going to get the parity within the context of the, rela uh, within some sort of a possession territorial relationship to the United States. I don't think that's possible for a couple of reasons. These, these insular cases that were the first cases that dealt with Puerto Rico as a legal matter, one, they created a framework that, that said that Puerto Rico had this, title, this designation as an unincorporated territory. That meant that Puerto Rico was not on a track to become a state. So that, 
and that hasn't changed. All right? Secondly, the terror as a the Constitution, Article 4, Section 2, says if it's a territory or property of the United States, Congress can make all the rules for it. So mm -hmm. even the citizenship, which I had alluded to before as being the least, even the citizenship of Puerto Rico that was granted by Congress, you know, no matter what has happened since, I think there's still a question of whether or not that citizenship can in fact be revoked or altered by, by, by Congress, right? Right? <laughs> but I think that's an issue. The other, the other thing I think that's relevant to the, to the question, Puerto Rico is a nation of Latin America. It is not a nation of the, it is not a part of the United, in fact, the, the insular case has also said that. Does it, it belongs, but it's not part of the United States. Our future, whatever it is, I think lies more with Latin America and the nations of, of Latin America, maybe in conjunction with Cuba and the Caribbean and Santo Domingo, but it is not a future, a cultural future that we share with the United States. Anybody wants to address that question from the podium? Uh, Anna? <laughs> Sonia is going to abstain. This. I, I want to say that um, the issue of statehood for Puerto Rico has gone before Congress uh, several times. And, and even though the statehood party has achieved more than 50%, Congress has said, no, we are not going to grant. You need two-thirds of the Congress in order to admit a territory into the Union. The states of the United States do not want Puerto Rico to be a state, and we have to make that very clear. It's been proven already. Just also just add with, to, to Anna's remark that I think it's very doubtful within the context of the United States that they're, that they're going to admit a nation that they consider to be non-white and has been considered non-white and the, uh, since 1898, and that if it were to become a state, would have a population of greater than 24 states that already exist, which means they would be entitled to seven, con as in many as seven House of Representative members and its two senators, mostly that would be aligned with the Democratic Party, and I think that poses some political problems. They couldn't, they will not consider the allowing Washington D.C. to be to have equal representation in Congress until they have a balance, they have some Republican mm -hmm. jurisdiction that they can let in uh, mm -hmm. to balance it off. So I think Puerto Rico is in this no man's land, and the idea of being becoming a state as a legal matter, I think it's almost impossible, and as a practical matter, it's almost impossible. Wow. La, la, la realidad es que históricamente, obviamente todo lo que él explica históricamente es la realidad. Lo que pasa es que hay una, hay una, hay una visión, hay dos visiones, hay dos formas de ver la vida. La forma obviamente idealista y agarrado totalmente de los, de los pensamientos y los, las formas de pensamiento idealista y están las formas pragmáticas. Decirle ahora a Puerto Rico o a los puertorriqueños que están en la isla, que no, que, que, que no tienen seguro social, que no van a ser ciudadanos americanos, que eso es not going to happen. That's a big, that's a big contradiction. It's not going to yeah. happen porque mm -hmm. obviamente la gente no va a aceptar, la gente no va a aceptar, la gente que ha pagado, por ejemplo, seguro social, que, que eh, no, no, eh, eh, la, la situación de hacer, vamos a ver, de pensar en Puerto Rico como una república, es una opción, al igual que otros piensan que puede ser Estado, odio hablar de este, de, de, de este tema porque a mí me gusta ver las cosas de forma pragmática, que es mejor para la gente, no para el ideal, eso no se come, para la gente, la gente en Puerto Rico necesita vivir igual que viven los otros, que es mejor para la gente de la isla para los puertorriqueños, Hace, okay, eh, unirnos, eh, re, realmente eh, formar parte, de, somos latinoamericanos, eso lo tengo clarísimo, pero la situación de eh, unirnos a Cuba, a República Dominicana, a Latinoamérica, los puertorriqueños de la isla, los que están allí, no lo ven así, perdón, por eso hay partidos mayoritarios y minoritarios, o sea, esa es la realidad. Obviamente, cuando las canchas se cambian, y ¿verdad? hablo cosas que a lo mejor no, no le gusta a mucha gente, sí. cuando las perspectivas, cuando los ojos cambian de lugar, cuando juegas al guard, o eres el catcher y no eres el pitcher, la bola se ve de distinta forma. La gente en Puerto Rico, bueno, ahí están las elecciones, a mi gusto o a mi disgusto. Ahí están. La gente en Puerto Rico, 
los que estamos allí. No vamos a dejar de ninguna forma, pienso yo, y yo por mí me da igual, yo no sé, yo no voy a colectar el seguro social porque en mi época no va a haber, aquí va a estar quebrado. El de acá va a estar quebrado, o sea que a mí no me lo van a dar. Eh, pero la gente que está allí, que necesita su Medicare, que necesita su Medicaid, yo creo que ahí hay una, una situación muy distinta de cómo se ve de afuera a cómo se ve adentro. Eso es todo lo que quiero decir. Una cosa se ve de afuera y otra cosa vive el que está adentro. Chicos, y se pone interesante y nos podemos poner a hablar de política, pero no va a pasar. Well, this is, lo que pasa but, es que la gente va a votar por su beneficio. Ajá. Claro, claro. Claro. Bueno, pero... <laughs> ah, no, no, pero eso, no. eso lo tenemos claro. Eso it's lo a, tenemos it's claro. A good, it's a good answer because now we got... No, 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 no. Lo que... Lo que No, pero no lo perderías, no lo perderías, por igual, igual, no. Bueno, bueno, eso lo decidiría el Congreso. Ah, there you go, there you go. Right. Viste, viste, lo va a decidir el Congreso. Entonces, cuando hablemos en el Congreso, nos dirán si nos los van a dar. Ahí estamos de acuerdo. I, I think, I think what's happening. Yo lo tengo claro y yo lo tengo clarísimo y, y la realidad es que y, y obviamente pues viví en Nueva York mucho tiempo, después viví en Los Ángeles, o sea he sido parte de la diáspora también, o sea regresé a Puerto Rico con un plan de a aportar al país eh, ya después que me había educado y que tenía la posibilidad de hacerlo, o sea que la realidad es que lo, que, lo único que quise traer, porque a veces nos miramos obviamente todo de nuestro lado, es que en la isla también hay un pensamiento y si la gente, lo que la gente quiera al final del camino, va a ser por lo que la gente vote. O sea, esa es la realidad democrática. I think what's happening claro, is interesting. ese es un buen punto. Uh, this, this panel, this panel is, it's really fantastic what's happening because we have two voices from the diaspora and two voices from Puerto Rico itself, whom are on the ground, who also have had experiences in the diaspora and still do have experiences in the diaspora, and getting their, their perspective. And just so we understand here the mentality of people on the island as well and why, what are they thinking should also inform the diaspora and their agenda and also their plan of action as well. It should be taken into consideration. So this is pretty good, very good. Now, uh, Myrna, I, I wouldn't want to let you go before, within the context of everything that's been said, and the whole issue with the deuda, is it possible to cancel this thing? Uh, what can be done? I could talk all day about that one. Ah, yes. Um, by the way, there's a documentary that was produced about three or four months ago in Puerto Rico called Bancarrota. Very good one, by the um, way. Mm. And I had an opportunity to participate on, on, on in, that, in that documentary. And, and it's, about, it's about the history of the, of the debt. Um, states and jurisdictions, municipal jurisdictions, borrow money for public works. Bueno. Este, we borrow money for public works. I mean, that's what municipal bonds are. And, and um, when going back to the 1990s, after NAFTA and after 936, when all those uh, companies started leaving and people started leaving, the state was not, as it is today, not um, receiving the tax receipts that they had, uh, that they had been receiving. And the users of electricity, the largest users of electricity, which were these huge industrial plants, started to shut down. And so you have a public utility like PREPA that begins to lose its clients, but it still has a, the fixed operational expenses that it has to deal with. And so the, the, what happened 
is that they said, well, well, let's, then the investment bankers come and say, how much money do you need to square off your budget? And the answer was, well, you know, I, I need four or five hundred million dollars. Well, don't worry about it. I'll get it for you. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, who were the buyers of the debt at the very beginning? The buyers of the debt at the very beginning were that middle, upper middle class of Puerto Rico. Vamos a estar claro. And the reason is because if you were you know, a professional, semi-retired, or had accumulated savings, and you went to one of the brokerage firms in Puerto Rico, and you don't, porque nosotros somos, we, we, are, we have contraband in our DNA. <laughs> <laughs> we do not like to pay tax. Now, you go back to the history of Puerto Rico, 18th, 19th century, of, of the, uh, you know, people figuring out a way to get around this para no pagarle al gobierno español. It's in our, you know, it's, it, we trade among the small islands. I mean, we're in archipelago that it goes from the Keys to Venezuela. Now we all have different names and all that, all that cosa, but we were one big archipelago. Mm -hmm. And so the trade amongst those islands up and down has, is the history of this place since it was created. And so, you know, having to pay to the state, having to share your earnings with the state is not something that anybody likes anywhere. And so if you're in Puerto Rico and you can get 6% tax-free income or 5% tax-free income, you're gonna, that's going to call your attention. And in addition to that, by the way, Puerto Ricans are citizens of the United States until you die. Your estate is taxed by the federal government of the United States like a foreign national, a non-resident alien. So if I have, in my lifetime, if I've accumulated a million dollars, and I have the apartment in Miami, and I have mutual funds from Oppenheimer and Vanguard and Fidelity, like everybody, Bella, and I, este, I, you know, I, I, I have bonds of the state of New York, and I die, those assets of my estate that are domiciled in the United States will not transfer to my heirs until the federal government steps in and taxes that part of the estate. Now, those of you who live in the United States and track this stuff, you know that the estate transfer tax in the United States says that the first $5 million of a, of a family's estate can transfer from one generation to the next without paying any tax. It's, a, it's an exemption of the first $5 million. Most of us don't know what that means, we're not there, but that's part of the debate right now in the federal government with the tax reform and so on. So the first $5 million of a US citizen's estate can go from them to their heirs with no taxation. However, however, if you live in Puerto Rico and you own assets in the United States, mutual funds, a 401k plan because you lived in the city, in New York City, esa cosa, and you move to Puerto Rico and you die, that part of your estate is taxed. The f only the first 60,000 are set tax exempt. Esto es así. So follow the money. This is why I insist, follow the money. Why does that happen? Because Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico residents are US citizens, but the territory is a foreign country. We are not part of the United States. We are a foreign country. And therefore, our states are treated as those of non-resident aliens. So what happened? We start creating Puerto Rico bonds, and we have the investment bankers say, you go to Bain Weber, Merrill Lynch, and you have some money, and they say to you, well, you can, you can buy these Puerto Rico bonds. They're double A by Moody's. Huh. Moody's, different topic. <laughs> Double A, triple A, que se yo. And guess what? They are tax free, income tax free to the government of Puerto Rico. And they are estate tax free to the government of the United States. And if you are a product of the boomer generation in Puerto Rico and you amassed a million dollars in personal wealth and you're told that you can protect that money by not having to pay income tax and not having to pay estate tax, you bought those bonds. 
So the question that nobody asks is who was buying the bonds? Y entonces, if you have demand, you can, you can loan up all you want. And they'll say you've got the issue of, you know, Puerto Rico changes government every four years. And so, que venga atrás que arregle. And I'm the, old, I'm the director of PREPA today, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lend, you know, I'm going to borrow money, and it's going to get paid in the year 2030. I'm not going to be here. 20, the heck with it. Go to the website of the, no, no, go to the website of the Puerto Rico Government Development Bank. Le, le, uh, bueno, escúchame. The data is there. I've written articles on this, and people look at me it's funny. I say, it's on the internet. Go to the website of the Government Development Bank for Puerto Rico, and you will pick an agency. There are 18 public corporations in Puerto Rico that issue debt. Cuando hablan de la deuda, it's 18 different issuers. Okay? Universidad de Puerto Rico, Prepa, Carretera, Hospitales, que se que se 18 of them. 18. Pick any of them. You go to the website, in Puerto Rico, and you can see every single bond issue, you have the prospectus, what is the purpose of the money. If there is a question about the legality of the issuance of the bonds, in my very personal estimation, that's not the question. The question is, what did they do with the money? See, sí, pero, pero the, there's a legitimacy in going to the markets and issuing, es como que tú le digas al banco, I, I need a personal loan so I can consolidate my credit cards. Y te lo dan. And you turn around and you say, you know what? I don't think I'll do that. I think I'll use it for something else. Is the bank going to come you and edit you, audit you? Chicos, we're going to. Mm. I'll come back and we can have another yeah. conference on this. Ah, chicos. Ah, pero óyeme, do you have cousins in Illinois? Prepárense los de Illinois. Same story in Illinois. One of the underlying premises of the language in Promesa that limits it to the territories is to not open the door to the bankruptcy in Illinois, the state of Illinois. This is, this is really beautiful because the idea of having this panel was to start changing the conversation and really open up our eyes to realities. Sometimes they are not pleasant to know, but information is empowerment. One question here is what can students do? Get informed and get active. Do your homework, ask questions, dig. If you've never been to Puerto Rico, go to Puerto Rico. Right now the community needs you. So let's give them a round of applause. And then we have Dean Garcia. So now in the, in the last uh, closing moments, uh, we have uh, Dean Garcia Reyes. She was the main brain behind this. It was her idea to put this panel together. So thank you, Dean. Really, it was a joy to collaborate. And actually, uh, Dean Garcia's family, it's interesting because they came from Puerto Rico and they went into the Dominican Republic. Now the migration is beginning to reemerge again. And now the latest data we collected uh, in 2016, before Hurricane Maria, is that in the Dominican Republic, there are more than 20,000 Puerto Ricans living there, besides the ones that go temporarily to the Dominican Republic. We love them, we welcome them, and we'll continue to support La Comunidad Puerto Riqueña. And I want to thank uh, our panelists. They're wonderful. Especialmente las que vinieron de Puerto Rico. Yeah.